I am very passionate about cybersecurity. However, when I talk to the people today, most of them would describe their relationship with cybersecurity as complicated. And if we look at how digitalization became part of our daily lives and we see cybersecurity incidents becoming very real, this is actually no wonder. So last year, the WannaCry virus attacked hundreds of thousands of computers around the globe. Hospitals had to delay surgeries, train services got interrupted, and in Germany, the waiting passengers even saw the ransom notes on digital displays. So what is it that we can learn from hackers? And while we explore that, I will also show you what we have in common with British coal miners. Something that is exemplifying our daily struggle with cybersecurity are actually passwords. We all have dozens of them, and we all have to use them every day. And increasing complexity, we need upper cases, we need to have lower cases, we need to have special characters, and I'm pretty sure very soon some engineers come up and tell us we even have to have some ancient hieroglyphs up there. You know, they might be technically very secure, but in the end, the result is that our passwords are a pain to use, and we start finding workarounds. So, you might have heard of the United States Central Command and Indo-Pacific Command, two command centers from the U.S. military operating um, operations from Middle East to Asia. What they did, they conducted an eight-year surveillance program. And during that eight years, they collected about 1.8 billion data records, which they stored on the cloud. Now, one might think the military is aware of a good password, what they actually did was they used no password at all. So all this data was sitting out there for everyone with an internet access. But it's even better if you work for the United States Army Intelligence and Security Command. These people used the cloud service to store their backup data on. And part of the backup was one virtual hard drive that has been used in intelligence communication. And this data was highly sensitive, labeled as top secret and even no foreign which means no foreigner, no U.S. military allied was allowed to see that data. However, they just followed the path of the colleagues and didn't use the password at all. So, but luckily, the Super Bowl Security Command Center actually uses passwords, but they struggle with them just like we do. So they come up with similar workarounds. They write them down or they depraise certain characters like an E with a three or an O with a zero which is kind of bad if you have an interview with a camera team that broadcasts all this information to an audience across the globe. So in the result, we have actually, actually successfully trained people to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for hackers to guess. Now, what is it that we are missing in our attempt to use cybersecurity technology in a much more efficient and effective way. And sometimes we find solution in a quite unusual way. And for this, I want to take you to a time travel. We go actually back to the year of 1949, when mechanization in British coal mines was in full swing. Back then, there was a study trying to find out why new technology is not automatically increasing productivity. And one group of miners, the management forced the miners to adapt themselves to this new technology, completely ignoring the needs of the workers and the way they have worked before. As a result, productivity increasingly dropped. So, on the other hand, there is a second group, and these miners were allowed to take technology to use it to innovate the way they work. They had a massive increase in productivity. And with that knowledge, the scientists came up with a few new paradigms trying to describe the situation. And one is humans should be seen as complementary to the machine, which means that in order to be successful, we have to do joint optimization. There's no good in just improving technology by completely ignoring the human factor. And the third one actually is, that we should use technology as an enabler, as a tool for innovation. Don't just use it as it is, use it in the right way.
And if this sounds familiar to you, you're right. Because yesterday's mechanization is today's digitalization. And we are much like the low productive miners some 70 years ago, because technology right now is rather limiting us. It's dictating our behavior. It's not serving our needs. But then there's this other group, this group of hackers who actually are so successful in using this technology. But what is it that we can learn from them? What is it that we can adapt from the hackers to actually improve our very own um, cybersecurity solutions? First, we have to find out what actually a hacker is. So, we all have a certain picture from all the movies and, and what a an hacker actually is, sitting in a basement with a hoodie. But actually, the founder of the Chaos Computer Club once said, a hacker is someone who tries to find to a way to make co toast with a coffee machine. And it's a pretty good example because a hacker is not someone bad. It's someone who is driven by curiosity. Someone who tries to find new ways to use technology to come up with something exciting and, and innovative. So how can we use this creative way of hacking together with our human aspect to build something that actually works for us. And now we can jump from 1949 to the 60s and 70s, because engineers already faced a similar issue. And they come up with the approach of human-centered solutions. They figured out that in order to define or to come up with something more meaningful, it has to be more than just technologically feasible. It has to be more than economically viable. It has to be first and foremost human desirable. It has to serve our needs. And engineers should design their solutions for their needs. We need to really get a deep understanding and an empathy for the people we actually develop solutions for, especially as cybersecurity is becoming so much important. Now, Let's apply this and see how this could actually work. If we look at our problem of the password today, right now we see, okay, our problem is to create a hard-to-guess password. And we have a pretty good straight engineered solution for that, something like this. And I know a few people here know what this is. Actually, this is a mathematical formula describing the complexity of a password with a nice result as something like this. Well, it is technical, feasible, and it is pretty secure, but actually it's a random string of characters that no one can barely remember. So, let's apply this human-centered approach to our problem. And the interesting thing is right now, we should take a step back first. We need to understand the problem. And as soon we, as we understood it, we can actually define the problem. And then works toward the solution. And as we are all humans, we are not a straight line. We have to collect all the insights. We need to build the empathy. We need to have the different views of people. So this is an up and down until we finally come up with the real problem, which is something like a secret that is easy to remember, but also complex enough for hackers. So you know, we now have this human aspect in the problem that has to be easy to remember for us. And the same way it's an up and down in finding the real problem that we need to solve, it's the same way with finding a solution. And sometimes a solution is not only technical, it's something completely different. And in this case, it is something that actually runs the internet. Cat memes. So the solution could be, for example, that we take a picture because our brain simply can remember a picture much better than this random password, this random sequence of characters. And with such a picture, if you think about that, we can associate words. And we can actually use these words to form a passphrase. And if we take our passphrase and make it unique to us, we simply call it the hacking cat. So actually we come up with something that's pretty long, but now I see the picture of a nice looking cat, and I now have a password that I can actually remember. So, instead of introducing more technology, we should rather take a step back, 
find the empathy for our users, for our own needs. What is it that we need to solve? And then we can experiment. We don't have to be engineers. We have to be designers. We have to be creative. And if we talk about passwords and what we could actually come up with, let's have a quick look at what hacking could do with such an approach today. For example, this was my friend. He was very proud of going to Dubai. And of course, we are all now on social media. He put a nice hashtag on it. So if you go on social media and look for a hashtag boarding pass, you find quite a lot of these pictures. But actually, this barcode is your password. Because this barcode is your booking reference number and your last name. The only two things that we currently need to log in to an airline ticketing system. And as I wanted to show him, he was on the plane to Dubai. I would have been able to log in and, for example, change the dates, charge him first class, which is nice if you're on the plane, but you get the bill. So, or if he would enjoy his stay in Dubai, well, we could even cancel the flight. So this is not really technologically advanced. This is something where someone with bad intention just can exploit human behavior and get into your life and mess with the data that is out there. And as we talk about passwords, there's one thing that always comes up. Can you crack my Wi-Fi password? And I have to tell you, I don't want your Wi-Fi password. Simply because I am your Wi-Fi. So let's see. Some of you have logged into the TEDx Zuriberg Wi-Fi. <laughs> well, actually, this is me. And actually, this is not the actual Wi-Fi. I just set up a fake access point. But I simply knew that people see this name on the screen. And they would assume this is the official Wi-Fi for this event. So there's nothing very technologically advanced, but I can just get out there, put the right name on it, and I know that people will sign up to it. What this means, I could now actually tamper with your iPhone, I could look at your traffic, or because people always think about stealing data, I could even inject some source code into your web browser that would make all of you mine or generate cryptocurrencies and bitcoins for me. So whenever you go out there, be aware that everyone in such Wi-Fi can actually access what you're doing. And sometimes it's simply a good solution to switch it off. Then because even if you don't connect to my Wi-Fi, you are actually calling all the Wi-Fi names you have ever seen before. And I could listen to, this is in the very end, to uh, these iPhones, to these Wi-Fis, and I could set up a fake access point, and while your iPhone is sitting in your pocket, or your Android, or your tablet, it would actually connect to me automatically without you even doing something. So a pretty good human-centered approach for that will be just turn it off. If you don't use anything, just switch it off and only turn it on when you actually need it. So I hope I could spread some passion and some curiosity for cybersecurity. <laughs> um, it's not a very technical thing. Just go out there and explore. Be a designer. Think about what actually works for you. And if you want to find a new password now, just think of a hacking cat. Think of a cat memes. Cats are cool. Cats will help you. And if your provider forces you, for example, to use still some numbers, just add them in the end. But now you have a tool to come up with a creative solution that works for you. Thank you. <laughs>